Yeah. yeah everybody wants everybody wants to trade still. Everyone wants to buy the dip. And I think you can see what happens if this in right. a couple but, of weeks. In the morning it goes up and everyone's bought the dip in retail. And in the afternoon the institutional comes in and pulls the rug and takes your money away. Right. And next day, same, you know, second verse, same as the first. Right. Yeah, it's uh I think it I think it should be expected though, you know. Um I don't think so. People, I mean people well, are still expected that the this run up that we have seen particularly in stocks in the very short, you know, since the first of the year, I mean, at some point it's, it, it always pulls back, you know? And so why are we ignoring that? You know, why, well, why because, do people think, Oh no, it's never going to pull back. Well, it always well, pulls it, back. <laughs> well, we have a whole new group of investors, traders. Yeah. That have come from the pandemic era. And, you know, you always buy the dip, you know, and so it always comes back. And right now, you know, we're, we're really not seeing, seeing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can just look, let me show a screen here and we can just look, you know. Yeah. Hold on. I mean, here's the S&P right today. And this goes all the way back to October when we started this trend up. Mm -hmm. You can see what happened. We broke out. Now we're below the 20. Now we're just following the, the Bollinger Band, but lower Bollinger Band down. Yeah. And everyone, you know, and this is this is like looking at the ocean right now, and the ocean is doing so well. So you're looking, you're coming down the Bollinger Band, you come down to our MACD, still looking bad, and then our stochastic still bad. So, you know, we can follow this Bollinger Band down for, for a while, and, and here's where I think it could go, right down here in the SPY, you know, a little over... Four four eighty, I think it's forty eight hundred to forty nine hundred. You know, yeah. this continues down, but you know, we're just in that mode that we're down, just following the Bollinger daily. On um, you know, close up, we're below the fifty. Um, we came up, we were playing around the intermediate intermediate resistance level, below the nine, the twenty, and nine are going down. We're below the fifty. You know, here's the the two hundred down there. If we got down to the two hundred. Forty six fifty on the on the S and P, you know. So uh, same thing on the on the on the Dow. I mean, yeah. the Dow is falling straight, falling uh, the intermediate or the uh, Bollinger Band. Same mm -hmm. thing on the oscillators. The oscillators are not, you know, picking up. And then the Qs, you know, the Qs are the same thing. Finally, the Qs were hanging in there. Look at this. I mean, just for for a couple of months, we just followed along the intermediate resistance, went sideways, mm -hmm. and now it just kind of fell apart a little bit. So, um, you know, it, in their platinum channel, we we do swing trading, and for the last several days, there, you know, I just said patience. When you know the, the market is telling you, you know, stay on the sideline, eat some popcorn, go cut your grass, you know, right. enjoy your life, and we'll tell you when to come back. And it just hasn't just hasn't done it yet. Okay. Yeah. So, there's some want to play in it. <clears throat> and if you're, you know, if you want to short the market, you know, try that out too. But, you know, <laughs> if you're not used to short and you don't understand it, it can be dangerous. Yeah. I think we're definitely getting to a point where some of this economic data is coming out. And along with, you know, banks, um, even though, you know, if you look at like, J.P. Morgan Chase. You look at uh, Goldman Sachs. Um, who else came out yesterday? Um, we had Bank of America. We've had you know a lot. Yeah. And, uh, those who don't, at... those who have trading arms to their business, they're making money trading in this market and have made money in this market. It's the question of now it's the regional bank system that well, I, mean, I have a question about. It's it's not even that. I mean, I look at J.P. Morgan. OK, and I, I'll just go off of what they wrote, you know, in the first J.P. Morgan posted solid earnings around 42 billion in revenue and 13.4 billion in net income, which grew 9 percent and 6 percent from last year. Respectively, the bank's Q1 net interest income or the difference between its revenue on interest earning assets 
minus the expense on its interest bearing liabilities, which means, you know, you and I open a bank account, they owe us interest, you mm -hmm. know, and then what they get paid, that's the difference. So they're having to raise that up a little bit so that the money doesn't come out of the bank. Okay. Yeah. So they're talking about the difference between its revenue on interest earning assets minus the expenses on its interest bearing liabilities increased 11% from last year, but declined 4% compared to the fourth quarter. The bank's NII fell quarter after quarter due to margin compression and lower deposit balances. So JP huh. Morgan's consumer and community banking segment reported net charge-offs on its credit card services of 3.3% up from 2.79 in the fourth quarter and 2.07 in the third quarter of 2023. Consumer delinquencies are also something to watch. 30-day delinquency rate on JP Morgan's credit card increased from 2.1% in the fourth quarter to 2.23% in the first quarter. So despite posting a solid net interest income of 14 billion, down just 3% from its 14.45 billion a year ago, the bank is bracing for continued drop in NII for 2024 as interest rates and funding costs remain elevated. So even JP Morgan, who's not known for, you know, being a consumer kind of bank is seeing what's happening. And then for, to your point, you know, you go down and, and you look at Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs, you know, they're more investment bankers and trading mm -hmm. desks, like you said, Yeah. but they still have issues on their, their NII. But then you get to Bank of America. Okay. Now Bank of America, they have, they're more consumer oriented. In fact, they open more checking accounts. I forget how many uh, in the last uh, quarter uh, than any of these other big banks. So Bank of America said net consumer charge-offs or the net debt that has been written off by the bank were $1.03 billion in the first quarter or almost 1% of the loans. And that's up from $913 million or 0.79% of the loans in the fourth quarter and up from $153 million or 0.58% in the same period a year ago. So they're starting to write things off. Of that total, Eight hundred eighty, wow. eight hundred ninety nine million or three point six two percent were for credit cards. They're writing off, okay. Already and for other loans, the direct or indirect consumer loans, the net charge off was sixty five million, up from forty nine million on regular loans. So the total commercial net charge offs were four hundred seventy millions or thirty two percent, three two percent of the total loans, up from two hundred seventy nine millions. So they're even seeing their commercial go up, and that's Bank of America. We wow. haven't even got to the regionals yet. No. Well, and I mean, what Bank of America owns Merrill Lynch, so they got that okay. sort of as a counterbalance for the most, you know, yep. semi counterbalance. It is, uh, but isn't Merrill Lynch more like E Trade anymore? Like more of a discount kind of broker? No, I mean, they're still wealth management. So they're still offer, you know, if you're looking for a financial advisor, they would, you know, they have mega million uh, minimums. And they have a sort of a whole slew of products that they pitch their, you know, they want to capture your lending. They want to capture your um, credit card. They want to capture all everything you do financially. And they're really good at it because they have the ability to offer, you know, corporate loans and stuff like that. But that also can bite you in the butt. But they have that asset management element that keeps you know the financial advisor element that in some way can counter uh that but they're not they're not like setting up an e-trade account they're not okay. they're not playing that game but it's it's it, it's interesting because it's a catch-22 with these banks because you know these banks have been offering highest interest interest rates to retain their deposits because we can go out to treasuries you know short at five and a half percent yeah you know uh, because customers are looking for better returns. Uh, and again, as money goes out, they have to raise their interest rates to maintain those balances. Right. But it's hard because, uh, you know, and, and they need to raise them up because they've had them ridiculously low in these big banks compared to uh, what the real interest rate is. But the problem is, you know, interest rates in general. And, and this week, if we look at what's going on with our market, what is it yesterday? Uh, Jay Powell came out uh, and said that the recent inflation data have indicated it will likely take more time for the central bank to gain confidence needed to reduce interest rates. He said that if price pressures persist, U.S. central bank 
can keep rates at their current level for as long as needed. So all of a sudden, I mean, what did we do? We started out this year, five, six interest rate hikes. Yeah. And then we went to four, three, two, and now we're looking at maybe not, maybe not even that. Yeah. And if you think about it, what, what they're trying to do, or I assume they're trying to do, is to reset the standard average of the Fed funds rate. Because you think about it, I, you've pointed this out, we've talked about it many times, but was it five and a quarter is average or so for, you know, historically? So right now they're at 5.33. What's the point of, if you're trying to reset the system and the cost of money, you're not going to lower it. I mean, the only what, the reason you lower it is because everything just collapses. Um, but isn't the problem, though, isn't the problem that these banks are, you know, full of treasuries at one, one under 1%, right? Okay. And now, you know, because the, the Fed is raising rates, now the cost of borrowing has gone up for the, for the U.S. government. So the U.S. government has and treasuries, okay, and bring in money to operate the government and to get that money out of stocks, which was until a couple of weeks ago, you know, risk on. Now they have to raise these yields so that it's pulling money away and even money markets, pulling money out of these banks to get these higher rates. Okay. So yeah. the banks, if you and I are pulling our money out, they have to do something to give us our deposits and that's selling. And that's what happened at signature uh, at, you know, Silicon Valley and signature. And we're going to see if that happens. And what was the other one? New York community that we just had an issue with, Yeah, you know, coming really up. So. I mean, yeah. so I, and I, I just look at it. How is it? I mean, U.S. Bank Corp came out today, okay, and it cut its forecast for the full year. Um, interest income on Wednesday and reported a 22% fall in first quarter profits as higher deposit costs and larger balances of rainy day funds to cover potential defaults continue to weigh on the sector. So they have to put all this money aside, these things default. And on the other side, they're having to, you know, these, they're having to raise their interest rates uh, to keep deposits in. It's, you know, it's like another catch-22. So, you right. know, so again, and then, uh, you know, it now expects it's NII, it's net interest income, uh, which is the difference between what banks pay customers on deposits and earn on interest between 16.1 billion and 16.4 for the full year. And it had forecast 16.6, you know, so we're seeing all kinds of issues with these mid-sized banks now. Even Citizens Financial came out today and said net interest income, the NII, Again, the difference between what it earns on loans and pays for deposit 12, tumbled 12% 12 to 1.44 billion. Okay. And then the bank set aside 171 million in provisions for credit losses in the first quarter, higher than 168 million from a year earlier. You know, so there we go again. Yeah. You know, and these are just, the banks are starting to come out. And these are not these are not the small regionals still yet. So we're gonna we're gonna have to see how this this works. Yeah. Well, and I think I think you know. If you want to consolidate the banking system, you just do this. You know, you just keep status quo. You know, keep rates high. They're they're bleeding out because of the assets they held from you know treasuries and stuff and mortgage backed securities from two three years ago. Um, you know, it probably would have been really smart for a lot of them what to unload a lot of that hold to maturity assets when the tenure was below, you know, 4% briefly. I mean, they would have been in that way. They just take their losses now and then redeploy that money into better yielding treasuries. But I don't know what the mechanics of that are. And, and if, even if they can do that. Um, but it, I think this is one of those things that it's slowly been creeping up since a year ago when Signature went under and all these others. But now we're coming into an environment where you got the tenure moving to higher. I didn't look at it today, but I think it was four point six three, maybe. I, I right mean, now. yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, it. And it's someone a big asked jump. me today. Yeah, someone asked me today in the Discord, what does it take to get that you know the tenure to come down? And there's basically three things that I can think of: interest rate cuts, okay, which isn't going to happen; mm -hmm. increase of foreign investment in our treasuries which isn't happening. In fact, it's going the wrong way or yeah. lower inflation. And we're seeing inflation is not getting any lower. So the three things that would help us with that are not there. No. So you can almost expect 
we may see a five percent tenure here pretty soon. I wouldn't. I wouldn't doubt it. And I think that we expected. And if you see that, then you start to wonder: well, I'm this money at my, in my uh, savings account. Um, would I be better off just going by to your treasuries? You know. Uh, and I think the more sophisticated are. That's what they're doing. And honestly, if you're a financial advisor and you wanted to collect assets right now. You know, and you, I would go after that bank, you know, that well, savings well, account number and say, hey, we can you get bet. you two year treasuries at what, five yeah. over five percent. If you had been if you had been a member of the Platinum Channel over the last year, you would be in the treasuries. So a lot of us are. Yeah. You know, when, when they started at four point eight percent, we started getting in and now mm -hmm. they went up to five and a half. Now we're sitting at oh, four point three six, four point three seven on a on a one month T-bill. Right. And so. And that's annualized, but we just keep rolling them over month after month. So you're going to get that with some tax savings on that, too. And again, you know, why why not sleep? Why not put your money to work, even if it's only five and a half percent? Listen to me, even if it's only five and a half percent. Right. When was it like as that? As opposed to watch, yeah, as a, watching your money go away, you know, by, uh, you know, I'm going to put it in here and hold it forever, you know, yeah. and uh, see if uh, NVIDIA can get back up to a thousand, you know. I have, I found a reason why that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> I have found I found the Nvidia killer this morning. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a publicly traded company yet, but it could be one of those. But anyhow, I think going back to the banking situation, um, the do, delinquency rates. Holy cow! The ninety day delinquency rates. You know, year over. Do you have years. a chart? Do you have a chart on that? Uh, of course I do, Mark. I want to see that chart. And I want to see the credit card chart. Okay, well, I'm going to show you this spreadsheet I created okay. uh, this morning. You, well, I and, tell you, with you and your dad, the apple had didn't fall far from the tree when it comes to spreadsheets. And no, it didn't. <laughs> uh, our thinking is a little different. Um, all right, so can you see this? Uh, yep, it's a little small, but I like it. Okay, let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger. So um, what I would, did was I brought in... 120 quarters worth of information on three really different things. And I'm building this out right now, but this is U.S. mortgage uh, delinquency by 90 days or more. And I want to show really start back here during the great financial crisis. And this line here where you see it highlighted, that is the rate of change from the previous quarter. So this is right here, um, June 30th of 2006. And you actually saw a decline in mortgage delinquencies by a negative 6.98%. Uh, um, but you got into third quarter, end of third quarter of 2006, and you saw a jump in delinquencies by 19.63%. And that continued on um over and just to give you some uh you know idea of how this number is highlighted anything with a rate of change over 10 percent if it's going up it's in red if it's a rate of change on the south side it's green because the less delinquencies in this case but you can see throughout um uh third quarter or uh third quarter of 2006 all the way into um what is that third quarter? Uh, th no, that would be first quarter of first 2008. Quarter. Mm -hmm. um, it dropped, delinquency rates dropped Dropped in the uh, third, second quarter of 2008, but it jumped up again. And that took us in to, until we saw a significant drop in um, the second half of 2009. And that's when TARP came about. That's when the money was started flowing back into this market. So I'm looking mm -hmm. at this and I'm going, well, that's interesting because that gives you an idea that when you see, like in this case, three consistent jump, you know, 10% increases in delinquency, you know, three quarters of that, you're pretty much got a trend going at that point. So that's t the great financial crisis. If I sort of scoop over here. And that was over... the financial crisis was based on mortgages and selling off tranche is a bad debt with good debt right so if you look at here and this is um in this cell here 
um, you can see this is uh, first quarter of 2020. So that's the beginning of the pandemic. And then second quarter of 2020, you saw a decline in delinquencies by 26.91%. Okay, that's continued on really pretty much until um, 2021. But if you remember back then, this is when everybody was receiving a mailbox check, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so money and, and cost of money, the Fed's funds rate was dropping pretty drastically. And we pretty much saw really no change from 2000, uh, second quarter of 2021 until um, third quarter of 2022, where we saw, well, no, actually you saw a bigger drop. Now, I don't remember, is there, was there another check or what happened in well, third quarter of 22? That, you know, that I don't recall, but I do know that during that whole time, I mean, interest rates were still low compared to where they are now. Oh, yeah. we didn't start, we didn't start raising interest rates until probably you're starting to see some red on your chart. Yeah. So this was, um, so this uh, right here is at the end of uh, 22 and you saw a 13.95% jump. And I, I'm trying to remember, when did the Fed start raising rates? Was that March of 22 or was that um, March of 20? That wasn't March of 23. Um, but that could be. So anyways, what we're seeing now is in this past year, at the end of uh, the um, uh, the quarter of uh, dis, uh, in December of 20. Three, so fourth quarter of 23, you saw a 12.28% jump in uh, delinquencies. And you saw that increase from the first quarter at 2.27, and then uh, jump to 4.35% 4, 4 in delinquencies. March Second, of 22. Huh? March, March of 22? Yep. Uh, so that's... Uh, up by a quarter, a quarter of a percent. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so, so yeah, that's right there. there. It looks like yeah, yep. So, okay, now this is the end of the year. This is uh, fourth quarter of twenty two. So that's when you start to see the jump from its previous, previously where it was. So now we're seeing that increase, and then this at the end of fourth quarter of this past year, two thousand twenty three we saw a 12.28% jump as well. Um, I'm really curious to see what first quarter looks like and then second quarter of 2024 and to see if we see three quarters back to back of 10% rate of change jumps in delinquency rates. And if well, that is the you, case, go ahead. I, I, I can tell you what that probably will coordinate with is, is uh, job losses. I'll put if we that. see we see an employment rate start to raise, yeah. you know, and again, we, we talked about, you know, the jobs reports and all that, how, you know, the, the headline number is, oh, wow, we're adding all these jobs until you look down into it. We're only adding part-time jobs, so right? people that have three jobs. So uh, if those start to go away, that may be some of this delinquency you're seeing is people are just having trouble, you know, even with three jobs. Trying yeah. to keep up with mortgages, you know, and and if some of these people had adjustable rates for some reason, for whatever reason, you know, those have done been going up. Yeah, well, it's so my other one is credit card that was ninety days. Um, the other one is household debt uh, service as a percentage of disposable income. It's not really as much telling. Um, and then household, U.S. household financial obligations, which you're not seeing much change there. And so what this column B here is, is the four quarter, four quarter average. So this is looking four quarters back and looking at the average of rate of change. And you're seeing an average rate of change in mortgages of about 6.73%. Um, disposable debt, household debt, and disposable. Incre increase or decrease of delinquency? Uh, increase. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the way I have this set up is that if it's a 10% increase, then it becomes really significant. Okay. Um, um, so if it, you know, 6.73 isn't 
significant yet. But we'll see what the first quarter numbers come out and look like here in the near future. But I thought that was um, that was sort of a um, something I've been working on. Um, and I think it gives insight to, you know, housing is one of the biggest purchases you can make. And um, what's interesting, you know, housing starts yesterday. They came out with the housing starts and they plunged almost 15 percent month over month on an annualized rate in oh, wow. March. Uh -huh. You know, and then same with building permits, permits 4.3%. So we're seeing the effect of, even though they say there's a housing shortage, yeah, uh, we're seeing the effect that of the interest rates again on housing. Yeah. And I, if housing goes down, as you saw before, people don't buy carpet, they don't buy refrigerators, they don't have roofers, they don't buy, you know, all that stuff. There's a lot right. that goes into housing. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, we, we see it through some of the tribe members we have. Um, and they're talking about, uh, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, they're talking about their businesses are dropping off and they're in the hardware business, you know? So so this is the repo, uh, overnight reverse repo agreement market. And as we can see, there is less demand for our US dollars than there was in the past. Do I have that right? So they exchange treasuries for dollars well, to create liquidity and then exchange it back. You were seeing the liquidity drain out. Yeah. Yeah. So that that was one of those I was like, that's unfortunate. Um, and then this is mortgage delinquencies. This is going back to, as you can see, it's an increase since uh was that probably third quarter of 22 of 21.28 yeah. percent pretty sizable right and then this is the uh PC, yeah PCE. and so going back to basically may of 23 you've seen a decline of 41.55 percent um uh what one are we looking at there's um, credit card delinquencies there yeah this so this is credit card delinquencies um this is from second quarter of 2003 so delinquencies in a year have gone up for 0.96 percent according to mm -hmm. this and then this one is total household debt of course has increased to 17.5 trillion what was the other chart i was looking for the interesting thing on that is you know i look at those charts okay mm -hmm. and there's your us you there was spending you just had okay yeah yeah. And, you know, yesterday or the day before, retail sales came out and everyone was happy because they went up seven tenths month over month in March, you know, following up a revised nine tenths of a game in February, much higher than the forecast of, you know, three tenths of a percent. OK, mm -hmm. well, you know, retail sales are going up because lots of things are going up, number one. And number right. two, your charts here show why, because people are on are, are putting on the credit card. Right. OK, to well, live. But also you think about if retail is retail sales based on the number of dollars generated in sales. No, it's spending. It's it's spending uh, uh, basically consumer spending. Uh, like in 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 March, eight of thirteen categories posted increases in spending in these products, and one was uh, non-store retailers. Okay, so you know people that don't have stores, gasoline stations. Okay, because we need gas miscellaneous store retailers, right. building materials and garden equipment, uh, food and beverages, health and personal care, and food services and drinking places, okay? So on the sales were down for sporting goods, hobbies, musical instruments, bookstores, clothing, electronics, and appliances, okay? Autos and furniture. So those are kind of more discretionary things that you have to buy. Yeah. You know, you can see it, you know, in the reports. But- on the things that we are buying, we're using credit, according to what I can point, you know, connect the dots to what your charts are saying. Yeah. Well, I think the other thing is, is isn't the cost of those goods going up as well because of yeah. inflation? Inflation, exactly. So, yeah. So you, you see all these re reports of, oh, yeah, look, the consumer spending more. Well, of course we're spending more. Have you gas station, you've been to the grocery store? Right. Well, we're spending more for less is what yeah. we're doing. And that's inflation. Yeah. Interesting. Not to mention, as we've talked about, the devaluation of our dollar, which is, you know, also cutting back, you know, our ability, 
uh, you know, on purchasing power. Right. Right. And I was trying to find a chart on that, um, on what that devaluation of that, of the dollar looks like. Um, but it's between eight and 10% is more of what I'm reading. So if your dollars decrease, decline between eight and 10%, and inflation is going up. And, uh, it was a Larry, forget his name. He was part of the government at some point, but basically he said, Summers, real, Larry huh? Summers. he was a treasury yeah. secretary. Yeah. He said he, in a tweet storm that he posted about a month ago, or X storm, what do they call it now? Um, he uh, he basically said real inflation is eighteen percent. So if you well, he went out, yeah, he he went and he calculated inflation like they used to calculate inflation. Yeah, which I'm yeah, like, I need to figure days. that out. Um, but yeah, I think it's one of those things that I. The, the, it's a basically a sh, you know a dog and pony show right now because it, it, you were in an election environment, bringing that back to the banking system. Um, I don't know how true this is, but I saw a video where news channel in, in Sydney, Australia, reported on a lady. And I think I may have shared this with you last week. Um, she went in with her ATM card, but she uh, di she she forgot it at home. And so she went inside to the bank to withdraw some money. And they said, we can't give you any money. And they, they were like, well, she was like, well, why? It's my money. She goes, we don't have any money in the bank. It's all now digital. And I don't know how true that is. So I look at a lot of stuff on internet as 50-50. But it, is that how it happens? Is that how you go to a digital currency? And and what does that do to these banks? Well, what he, I think when he means digital, I think they mean they don't have physical cash. It's just digits in your account now. Right. Okay. Which it's not it's not like a digital coin or anything. It's just digits in your account. And you know that's what Fed Powell said when they talked. He was in a sixty minute interview. Mm -hmm. They were talking about you know how do they pay for all this stuff. He says, well, you know we we create you know bonds and and you know and 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 then sell them off to the banks and blah blah blah. And, and the uh, commentary is like, well, where do you get that money? He says, well, it's just digital. We just make it up, basically, is what it is. Yeah. Well, Bernanke, you know? Bernanke is famous for that. We just move the decimal over. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's yeah. what's happening when we go get a treasury bill. Okay. You and I go get a treasury bill. The government promises in, in, uh, in 30 days to pay back uh, our money with the annualized interest of whatever it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is they're selling us, let's say we put $5,000 in. For $5,000, they're basically giving us a digital piece of paper that says, we owe you this money. Yeah. And then the next month, it comes in. Well, where do they get that money? Well, it's from other either bonds coming off where they have money and other bonds that maybe are longer term, two or three months, you know, that they have money coming in. It's it's a giant scheme, if you yeah. think about it. Yeah. Well, and the thing you're is, paying, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, basically. Yeah, I guess. And that's where at what point does the confidence to buy a treasury get so low that people don't and there is like well, I mean, no demand. And maybe that's seeing that we're seeing that now in you know, foreign governments. But as long as they keep raising the interest rate and if the, if the markets are coming down, OK, like we've seen. And people are losing money. That money will flow out and flow into treasuries as long as, yeah. the, as the rate is, is is higher. Yeah. I think what Jamie Dimon came out and said 8% on the tenure is really likely. I mean, as long as they can pay it, that's a pretty sweet deal. <laughs> you know, um, you know, that's what back, I remember having a client who once said, you know, I should have bought the longest dated CD back in the late seventies, early eighties. You know, you were getting 10, 15% uh, mm -hmm. on that. He's just like, you can't get that now. Well, who knows? Maybe we're going back to that. Um, yeah. Could be. So, yeah. Well, I don't know. Knows. Again, it's, it's a, it's a strange time to be in because people haven't been, a lot of people haven't been through inflationary times before, but right. not only do we have inflation, we have, just exploding debt, which is devaluing our dollar. So we have both at the same time. It's like the perfect storm, you know, uh, uh, that we should be getting that fax off the machine that says you're heading into the <laughs> the belly of the monster, like the perfect right. storm movie. And that's what I feel kind of like we're, we're doing. And so you really need to protect yourself 
you need to ask your financial advisors, you know, what do you, what do you think about this? See what answer they give. Yeah. Chances are it's uh, oh yeah, no, no, just invest for a long term. It was interesting. I'll just share, yeah. I'll just share this with you. I, so I subscribed to, I canceled pretty much all my subscriptions because I realized I'm not getting anything from them. And except your platinum subscription, which except for my about. platinum subscription. Right? That's right. Uh, no, but it was like all my research stuff. And so I ended up subscribing to this company I had when I was in the financial advisory business, I used to use because it was data and I could import that data. And like you saw in that Excel spreadsheet, I'm able to import that data and manipulate it the way I want. So uh, yesterday or Monday, I did a, uh, uh, you know, welcome to our company call. And because it's so oriented to financial advisors, it was very common for him to say, you know, we have some great reports on if you just stay in the market or uh, if you miss the the best five days program. Oh, one, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I'm like thinking to myself, really? How about I said, can I adjust the inflation rate on these things to what it really is? And he goes, yeah, you can't change any proprietary trend, you know, reports, but you could, you know, model it in a different way, you know, through this avenue. And I just, I found it, I was like, yeah, yeah, they haven't changed. The industry hadn't changed, you know. No. Um, but it's, like, it's again, it's all about gathering assets more than managing assets, in my opinion. Yeah, I it is. Um, so I want to show you one, one other thing about the bond market that... Um, you see it? Uh, yeah, yeah, nope. There it is. Okay. All right. So this is the move index. So this is the volatility index for the uh, bond market. And if you go back to April 1st, we were at 96.13 on that. Since then, we are now at... 119.58%. So what that is saying is that <clears throat> we are seeing a jump in the volatility in the bond market. And when we have seen that in the past, you saw that back in 2020 um, and through the, through the pandemic, it got as high as 164. Um, it then here in uh, was it March of 23 when the banking system went upside down, it got as high as uh, 197. We're now back in a trend where we're starting to move higher in the volatility of, of the bond market, which is telling because it can, in a way, indicate that um, we're going to continue to see yields continue to rise in a pretty rapid rate, bringing that back to the banking system where they're they have to hold so much in. Uh, U.S. Treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, this could be a very, you know, a, sort of a signal that those assets in those banks are going to really put more and more pressure on those banks and potentially cause those banks to, in, we could potentially see another folding of small, a uh, handful of small and regional banks because of this exit out of, of uh, the bonds, you know, High grade bonds and that kind of thing. And can you move that back to 2008? Just be interesting to see. This thing is a data hog. Okay, there right. you go. Look at 2008. So it's, it got as high as 214. Yep. You know, when so I compare you, that to 2023, you know, and that was. Yeah. So 2023 is, that as, far is, back as that, is that as far back as that goes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, can around, I can see right around 2003, we had a little blip up there too. And so it'd be interesting. Yeah. I think this is, you know, this is something to take into account. But you look at what happened here and where these guys made a ton of money in the fixed income market, like the institutions, the hedge funds, was they started buying bonds in, in this area. Mm -hmm. And at the peak, and they made a ton of money all yeah. the way into probably 2013. So yeah. inverse looking, relationship, price versus yield. Yeah. And so if we see another jump like that, a lot of people don't think of bonds as an opportunity. Um, 
and I look at this and I go, well, this, this is a very, potentially a very big opportunity. I'm like, let me see if I can pull up TLT here. So this is TLT. Yep. That's, uh, so it was at 93, really where we're at today, pretty, pretty much. Pretty close. Yeah. So not as much of a drastic move uh, until here in uh, 18, November of 18, you saw a move higher. So um, it's just figuring out what is the best way to play that when that day, if that day comes, you know. Well, right uh, now, yields are going up. So TLT price is going down. Yeah. So when yields start coming down, TLT price will go up. Right. Is basically so it, what it is. Yeah. And so it's a matter of just identifying when yields have peaked mm -hmm. out on the top side. And, uh, yeah. And that's yeah. why we, I mean, we can, we look at it, we've swung trade it before on the charts, you know? Yeah. But, um, right so now anyways, it's not, it's not looking so good right now. But. No. I mean, if you're going to see, you know, what, uh, if you see the uh, 10 year get to eight, I mean, that's what, three and a half, 3.4% or 400 basis points, 340 basis points from here. Is that what the increase is? Something like that. Yeah. yeah you well, got I mean, to. Yeah. If the we, interesting if we, thing is, is that the, the yield curve still inverted, okay? Yeah. And if that thing, if that thing de-inverts or disinverts or whatever they call it, mm -hmm. you know, typically we see recession after that. So. Right. Uh, what if I have that chart here? No. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think that's this is where you start to really look at your allocation, and consider. How much time do you have left until you you're gonna really need that money, and do you have enough time to recover from a a really sizable meltdown? Um, because this one's bigger than, I mean, our leverage ratio is bigger than what it was in during the Great Financial Crisis by what ten times I think it is. It's pretty gigantic. So that's what some what some people say. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's uh you know, this is when you risk manage. Sometimes sitting on the sidelines in all that bad, <laughs> but yeah, I mean that's where that's where I'm sitting right now. And of course, yeah. we're just a couple of yahoos from right from middle middle America, and uh, that's how we see things, you know. Yeah, I don't need CNBC, or we can read our own reports, and we can go to make our own inflation call based on what we see in a, at the grocery store and a gas station, even though you know food and energy are core, and you know they get taken out because obviously right. you no. Know, that doesn't bother anyone. We can see what happens to our our property taxes and our car and home insurance, you uh -huh. know. And uh, it's it's you know your dollar is not going as far as it used to. Yeah. That's for sure. That is true. Well, cool. Well, anything else you gotta you want to hit on? No, I, no, no, I no. But I just think that uh, you know we talk about, about these things all the time each week on the Platinum Zoom call, and and uh, we look at. at Positions right now, you know, we're the only position that we have in our swing trading portfolio is uh, is, is the dollar index, <laughs> which <laughs> is not very exciting, but it is it's popped up a little bit. But you're, you know, it is what it is. We 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 play the charts and we don't play the emotions. Yeah, I think uh, more and more I look at it that way. Is that the charts are going to tell you the direction of of money flow is going to tell you where things are headed. You can well, have a great thesis just, about something, but if the money's not flowing into it, it ain't going up. <laughs> right. And, you know, money's been flowing, you know, out of, I mean, we've looked at last week, every sector of the, of, of the S and P, you know, it's, and all those charts were flowing out, you know, and, and they're, they're not tradable at this point from a swing trading point of view. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've seen gold and commodities, you know, be where money's flowing, you know, yeah. and, Money market funds and treasuries. Yeah. That is gold is the biggest um, thing that shows up on on my ETF uh, tracker. It's like I, I'm like okay, you know you can't have five gold gold, gold ETFs in, in your port in your twenty uh, selection. You got to weed them out uh, so you, you find the best you know a representation of that. But gold is a dom gold and silver are dominant in that right now. Um, and and that's part of the platinum channel. That's part of what you get. Right. 
So copper, yeah. copper's been dominant. We've had oil until recently be dominant. Yeah. So you know, um, we'll be watching, you know, we'll still watch food and wheat and soybeans and corn, which haven't been dominant lately. Okay. Right. Cocoa, cocoa has been off the rockers. You know, it's yeah. come down a little bit this week. So uh, it should because it's so high. Yeah. Is it, but since... but money, money flows to the value, and that's what we got to find. You know, and uh, the big institutions just don't sit their money and let it sit there. And, you know, time in the market's better than time in the market. They move to where the money is. Yeah, that is true. Well, cool. All right. Until next week. Thanks, Mark. We'll, what will uh... we talk about next week? Oh, who knows? <laughs> Maybe you know, markets have markets have been so boring lately. Nothing to talk about. I know. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting for it sure. Is.